We're talking about the future of NASA in this edition of Let's Make America Smart Again. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I've got my co-host, Chuck Nice. Hey, hey. Tweeting at Chuck Nice Comic. Thank you, sir, yes. All right, and I've got with us, since we're talking about the future of NASA, we got somebody who has just been working for NASA for the last several years in the capacity of chief scientist. I've got Ellen Stofan here. Ellen, hey, thanks nice for coming. To be here. Not your first time on Star Talk. Not my first time, but oh. always happy to be here. Excellent, excellent. We love this. And so, uh, Chuck, you've been soliciting queries. Yes, I have from uh, all about over the, the internet the, about the future of NASA. So That's let's correct. see. And in this, again, the, our goal here is to imagine a smarter America going forward. Absolutely. So let's see. What do you have here? All right. So Anna Jesus, uh, coming to us from Facebook, would like to know this: <clears throat> What is the main difference between NASA and SpaceX in terms of what they would like to achieve in space exploration in the near and far future? And uh, let me add to that, what is the chief purpose of NASA, or what is NASA's mission statement? Uh, well, I should be able to quote NASA's, NASA's mission statement from memory, but I, but I can't. But it's basically to understand our world, our solar system, our universe, and to use technology to move humans beyond Earth. That, that is really, if you want to sum it up, that's NASA's mission, exploration, knowledge. Uh, cool. So. SpaceX Coalition. is a contractor to NASA. NASA has lots of, of industry partners. SpaceX is one of them. They launch cargo up to the International Space Station. Starting next year, they'll launch crew up to the International Space Station from Florida. Um, so they're one of many contractors. Now, obviously, SpaceX has obviously stated that they want to see humans on Mars. NASA wants to see humans on Mars, so our goals are actually really aligned, and we have a partnership with SpaceX to help them land one of their Dragon capsules on Mars. Uh, and I'm excited because they've done a lot of work on entry, descent, and landing that'll hopefully make it able for us to land humans sooner. You said Mars. earlier that uh, one of the challenges is that Mars has a thin atmosphere. Could you detail why that's more of a challenge to EDL, entry, that's descent, right. land, than on Earth? Uh, our atmosphere is much denser, so if people haven't seen, there's a great video that uh, JPL put together before the Curiosity the rover, Laboratory. The, the before the Curiosity rover landed, called Seven Minutes of Terror, and it basically takes seven minutes when you're coming in from a trajectory from Earth to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface. So you have to slow yourself way, 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 way down. Because you've got good speed to get there. Yep. Now you got to eat up that speed somehow. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and to absorb that speed coming, the atmosphere is just not helping you very much, but mm -hmm. it's heating you up, which is bad. So you've got to find some way to slow yourself down. So Curiosity weighed one metric ton, and we used a combination of... On uh, Earth. <laughs> <laughs> on Earth. <laughs> Unless that's the mass. <laughs> was it a mass of, yeah. of, of 1,000 kilograms? Yeah. yeah, so we used a heat shield, parachutes, this bizarre thing called a sky crane to land it on the surface. We estimate for hum humans, you're going to need 20 to 40 metric tons landed on the surface. Um, and the more you can bunch that into single landings, the cheaper it is. So there's, there's issues with that. So how are you going to slow yourself coming down? You're going to have to use something called supersonic retro propulsion, which basically it means... Like it hurts. Yeah. It, it, it does, because <laughs> you're firing retro rockets while you're going at supersonic speeds which causes all kinds of turbulence. Everything you're shooting out the back comes back at your spacecraft at supersonic speeds. So it's a crazy thing. SpaceX has actually been working on it. Oh, that's right. So, so if you're moving supersonically and you try to put retro exhaust in front of you, you overtake the exhaust. <laughs> right. yeah. Exactly. That's so wild. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. Yeah, so wild. it's complicated. To, mm. to say the least. So you can't we just roll down the window and stick your hands out to slow down. <laughs> no, no. So, it, and it's not that it's an insurmountable, oh my gosh, we can't ever send humans to Mars, it's too hard. And, and it frustrates me sometimes, I'll see commentary of saying, oh, we just need to stick at the moon. Mars is too hard. Mars is not too hard, we can figure it out. Yeah, yeah. just any engineer would froth at the mouth to have the opportunity to exactly. solve these problems. Exactly, and again, when you solve tough problems like that, you're, you're stretching technology, you're stretching computational skills. You're patenting. You're, you're patenting inventing, stuff. Yeah. You're, you're spinning off stuff into our economy right here on Earth. Cool. Give me another one. All right, here we go. This is uh, Jeff Sosteretz. And uh, Jeff says, uh, Chuck, you have butchered my name too many times. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I'd like to clear the record. It's sauce like spaghetti and Tourette's like the syndrome. Sauce Tourette's. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for phonetically uh, clarifying your name. Uh, here is what he wants to know. What is the average age and education of a NASA employee? Is the demographic getting younger or older over the years? So are we attracting people to NASA? By the way, we all saw the video of the launch and return of the first stage in the SpaceX um, uh, uh, rocket, and you see mission control for SpaceX. There's nobody there over 30. There's uh. one old fart who's 40 in the corner, <laughs> just looking around like this. Everybody else who's jumping and hooting and hollering, they, right. they, I don't, if they're 35, I'm, uh, so they, that skews young, it looks to me. It does skew young. And if you look at our NASA centers, which again, we have nine NASA centers plus our federally funded research and development center, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, making FFR 10 DC. around the Just country. That's, that's, is that how it yes. rolls? If you're, in, if, you're in, if you're in the loop? If you're in the loop, <laughs> FFR DC. Exactly. Right. No, you still struggle. You still I, stress I, I almost, yeah. It almost yeah. rolled off. You it's, know what I mean? It's hard you know. to get it to roll off. Yeah. But, I need uh, to know more about the FFR DC. The, the average age is about 52 Ouch. to 56, depending on the center. Now, part of that is because we have people who who don't want to leave. You know, they love what they do. They're still productive. We've had scientists who are still, you know, writing significant papers in their 80s. So that does tend to hurt your your Averages. statistics. Um, on the other hand, you know, I the, know it was in the 60s. Everyone just died at age 60. That was it. Well, it's kind of. <laughs> so. <laughs> we have people who don't like to retire. They it's love the what they do. Smoking, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of smoking and a lot of ham <laughs> consumption. <laughs> that was, ham was a big part ham of American was a diet. Big back part then. of American it, diet. It back every holiday, yeah. everything, yeah. everything. Yeah. And then when you didn't have ham, you had spam. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I, told, I told my now. son that spam was food. And he said, what, Danny? <laughs> what? Dad, you're eating emails that you don't want? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm sorry, go, go on. Ahead. Where go were you? Uh, so we've also had periods of time where the federal government has hiring freezes on. And, so, and, and NASA downsized when the shuttle program ended. So all of that's combined to make the federal, our federal workforce older. And we need more younger people in there. When you have a hiring freeze, but it applies to NASA? It's a brain freeze. Nice! <laughs> Ooh, was that good? That. Was that yes, good exactly. What do I, I get on a B plus? I, I, I'm going to uh, give you a B plus C. on that one. You, you said C? <laughs> yeah, say. okay. B. <laughs> No, no, no. No, yeah. it's a brain freeze. It's a brain freeze. It, it's a, if, if it applies to NASA, it's a brain freeze because you're not you're not bringing in fresh fresh brain blood. All right. Right. Which means that there, those 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 resources are being allocated someplace else, most likely Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> right. And but and, and the other thing is though you really want that mix of ages yeah. because you know we've got people who really know how to land on Mars. You, you know, we have people who know how to keep humans up in space safe. So you need that kind of wisdom and you need the fresh blood coming in that's going to carry that forward. But you also so you need, need a both. culture where fresh blood who is not biased by how you always did do it can be open to a new idea. Exactly, and that, that need for innovation is something that uh, we worked on a lot over the last couple of years at NASA. How do we ensure that we're the most innovative? As a 50-year-plus 50, 50 old agency, you really do worry about are you being the most innovative, and NASA worries about that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I know the age of NASA because it was founded the same week I was born. 1958. So I, I, I feel the pain. Yeah, a lot of people don't. I, I feel... <laughs> a lot of people don't know this, but he feels uh, that lack of innovation. Yeah, whenever, whenever Neil calls NASA, uh, the the message is, "I'm your father." <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, here we go. Actually, it doesn't sound like I am your sibling. That right. doesn't yeah, work. Doesn't work. Right. Here we go. Brad um, Carico uh, from Facebook would like to know this: Does NASA have a future solution to the growing space junk? Problem. So, are you guys Ooh. working on this? Ooh. Uh, NASA's working on it. A wait, wait. Lot where of, space junk come from? Um, space junk is because over the last fifty plus years, we, we put a lot of stuff up there. Um, some of it has broken up, so there are actually even like old stages of rockets 
pieces of spacecraft. There's been, and there was an occasion a couple years ago where two spacecraft ran into each other um, and it created a whole lot more pieces of, of debris. So there's just a lot of stuff up there. Now it, it slowly, slowly deorbits, but we do worry about it. A couple times a year, they have to move the International Space Station slightly to avoid space junk, other satellites. We have to watch when we launch things to say, is there anything else on the path? Now, space is big, so this isn't anything to panic over, but space agencies around the world and private companies are looking at how do we literally vacuum that stuff up? And people have, I've seen proposals wait, wait, Back of, up, back up. Wait, the space station is not a particularly nimble thing. No, it is not. And it's not even sort of structurally, I mean, this, um, I, I like this. For those of you who are listening, Neil is doing a space station <laughs> dance. No, so my two yeah. arms are like the solar panels, right? right? Okay, yeah. And it's you're and not so participate here. like if you push over here, this will like bend, but you're not going to push the whole. Th I mean, so you're telling me they do avoidance maneuvers with the International Space Station they, so that they don't they run do. into somebody's shoe or whatever piece of debris was <laughs> left in space? They do. And they've even had rare occasions where they realize there was debris approaching the space station and they haven't had time. Because obviously to do a maneuver, you have to say, you have to plan this out. This isn't something you mm. want to be like, oh yeah, let's move, Psh, you know. Yeah, it's not so, the Millennium Falcon who can right. just... N no. Mm -hmm. So there have been times where the astronauts have actually retreated into the Soyuz capsule and waited out a, a potential debris encounter don't you love the way that's phrased? A potential debris encounter. Right. Something crashes. Death. Into the space yes, station. yes. Death. <laughs> so, NASA so they, for death. <laughs> but it's avoided. I mean, the space station, if, if you looked at it closely, it's got little pings and pock marks all over it from little tiny pieces of debris hitting it at 17,000 miles an hour. Um, and so that creates little problems. But so far, but to get back <laughs> no to your problem. question, yeah, yeah, no problem. No problem. 17,000 mile an hour debris. Yeah, that's all. But that's why it's getting old. And at some point, we will have to deorbit the space station. Right now, it's funded through about 24, by about 28. This, for example, the 2024. Solar, 2024. So by about 2028, a lot of the systems will be degrading, especially the solar panels, which right. are getting pinged by this micro debris all the time. So when we deorbit that, does the who puts a new one up there? And when do we do that? You know, that's a great question. And so there's this big, what is going to happen to low Earth orbit right. after the space station? Is it going, you know, you know, if you talk to NASA, they would like it to be the commercial, the private sector that moves in, private space stations, a place for, you know, private company, space companies, Blue Origin, SpaceX, Orbital ATK. Let's find the private sector going, yeah. going to low Earth orbit. As imagined in the film 2001. Exactly. All, there was Howard Johnson's up there, Pan Am ran the shuttle. Right. Pan Am, for those of the younger of our audience, right. a former uh, airline company. It's the, uh, it's the Virgin America before America was a virgin. <laughs> okay, that's good. But, that's basically you know, what it was, yeah. yeah. If, you really, if you really get underneath that, NASA spends about $3 billion a year on the International Space Station. And if we want to send humans to Mars, we want to take that $3 billion and start, start building what will be the Mars transfer vehicle. What, humans will go in on that journey to Mars. If, if they have to keep spending it on the space station, there's not going to be no money to go, to go beyond low Earth orbit. Couldn't we just have another $3 billion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I would look at it. That heads. would be a great solution, wouldn't it? Then we wouldn't have to worry about this. But as it is, there's not enough money to do both right now. There is not. So NASA's budget plans for moving humans to Mars count on the space station budget um, declining through the mid-2020s and zeroing out in the late 2020s. So now, because, and, okay, I'm sorry, I have to ask this. Since you were there, and this all sounds highly political to me because you're talking about budgetary issues, but isn't there a way to take the uh, billions of dollars that are going into Lockheed Martin making a fighter jet that we do not need or tanks that we are building that the government that the I'm sorry the military has said we do not want them but yet because it's a jobs program we have to make them anyway couldn't we just find a way to shift this money over to NASA so that I mean it, it there there's clearly inherent benefits and discovery and technological advances that will 
be wrought from going to Mars as opposed to a tank that we're never going to use because we're never going to fight conventional warfare again. We now have nuclear wars. Anybody we're going to fight is going to have a nuclear warhead too, so we're not going to do that. So why can't we just find a way to politically get the senator or the congressman to say, hey, look, we'll give you the money. You just got to build whatever you're going to build over in my district. Chuck Nice 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, are you ready to go up there and uh, make America appreciate science more again? I can't remember your... Uh... Make America smart again. There yeah, we go. Yeah, there yeah. we go. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I mean, it, it, what, what is the process at NASA to, well, to, to, well, and I to think talk it, to these people? Well, you know, NASA can't lobby Congress. That's not actually allowed. Um, so outside supporters can talk okay. to NASA. I am flabbergasted. NASA can't even advertise. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, that's get, not that's You not guys allowed. are killing me. Are you kidding me? Well, wait, no, wait, wait, no, no, wait. No, no, no. To, just to be clear. Um, what the military does when they have TV commercials during the Super Bowl yeah. is not, that's not technically marketing. They're right? recruiting. No, no. Yeah, they're recruiting. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. So what happened oh. was when I was on one of my commissions, uh, uh, we were approached by an ad agency that wanted to create sort of public service spots for NASA to recruit. Right. To recruit scientists and engineers in the spirit of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines recruiting. Right. And that way you can justify commercial time for it. And there's some of the most beautiful commercials I've ever seen. And it was just the, the, the tradition to do that is just not there. And yeah, that is so sad. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it's uh, it's it's almost as if our government has stacked the deck against what we should be doing. No, no, but it, it but it it sounds good the way it is. But imagine that in a limit where it's out of control, yeah. because all it says is we taxpayers elect officials who then establish budgets for agencies. The agency can't then market itself. To ask for more budget. To ask for more budget. Okay, that Because it's sense. a completely external activity from it. I understand right. that. So that's, that's uh, that why. That makes sense. And while we all feel good that NASA should be able to do it, in the limit, you don't really want that happening okay, in I government. That's right. all. No, that makes sense. That's that, all. Because, uh, yeah, I don't, want, I don't want the agriculture department doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So you want just get, NASA to do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I only want NASA to be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to take a quick break. When we come back, more Cosmic Queries in the Let's Make America Smart Again edition of Star Talk. We'll be back with Ellen Stofan, former chief scientist at NASA.